The axles on my 2015 Jeep Wrangler have been taking some serious abuse over the years. We've put a lot of weight, some big tires, and we've been hitting some hard trails. These things are getting pretty fatigued. It's time for a change. We're gonna talk about axles and we're gonna upgrade these in this video. Stay tuned. Welcome to Trail Recon, I'm Brad, and today we're talking about my front axle. Because if you go back with me about four and a half years ago when I got my Jeep, I knew that I wanted to go hit some trails and have some cool adventures, but I honestly didn't know it was gonna go to this extreme with the bigger tires and the overlanding and the rock crawling we've done. But I did know that I wanted the best capable Jeep right out of the dealership. So I got the Rubicon, which comes with a Dana 44 front axle and some beefier suspension and the lockers and the sway bar disconnect. And I was really happy with that in the beginning. But as things began to evolve and we hit more trails and added some bigger tires and more weight to the vehicle and we hit harder trails and we went further and further and the miles started to accumulate, these axles started to get really fatigued. And so I did a couple things over the years. One, we upgraded to some chromoly axle shafts. I put some Dynatrack ball joints in there. We upgraded the sea gussets and we put a diff cuffer on there as well to give it a little extra strength. But recently we've been making some repairs because it's getting really fatigued. And so now I've got to make a decision on what to do next. Do I continue to upgrade this axle, make the repairs, or is it time to just pull it and add something new that's going to be reliable and dependable and stronger? Well, that's what we're going to do tomorrow morning. Tomorrow morning, we're heading up north. This one's coming out and a new one's going in. We're gonna ask all kinds of axle questions and we're gonna see some comparisons from this one to the new one. I think you're gonna really enjoy checking this out. I know I'm excited, I cannot wait. I'll see you guys in the morning. Well, good morning. I just drove an hour and a half up here north to Huntington Beach, California to the Dynatrack facility. That's right. Today we're gonna rip out that front axle and we're gonna install a new Dynatrack axle. Now I realized on my drive up here this morning as I was sipping coffee and thinking about what we were gonna talk about, I haven't told you what axle we're putting in the front. Well, I'm gonna save that here for a little bit. What I wanna do right now is let's go inside and take a look around. Let's show you how easy it is to actually pull an axle out and then we'll put it side by side with the new one and I'll tell you all about the new axle. I am super excited about this upgrade. Let's go inside. One of the things I really enjoy about partnering with manufacturers is being able to see behind the scenes on how things are actually built and made. Today was an off day for most of the Dynatrack employees, but it was still fun to walk around and just check out the warehouse facility, get a close up look of all the parts and equipment that were on the shelves, and take a look at some of the finished products that were awaiting to be shipped out. Dynatrack does a lot of standard and custom axle builds for folks, and it was great to see this manufacturer taking place right here in the USA. I've pulled a few front and rear axles in my time and the first time I did it it really seemed a bit intimidating but honestly once you assess what really needs to be unbolted to remove your axle housing off the Jeep you quickly realize it's a pretty straightforward process. The first order of business is just to remove the wheels and the tires and then it's good to go ahead and just disconnect the ABS sensor wires from their hangers and then you can remove the two bolts holding the brake caliper in place and then it's a good idea to zip tie that up and out of the way. Then the brake rotor should just slide right off. Next, he went ahead and removed the two U-bolts holding the drive shaft in place and just secured that up and out of the way. Okay, so we've got the Jeep lifted and the tires are off and the brake calipers are off. Steve behind me here at Dynatrack is making quick work of this. I just want to point out though that this is really easy to do. This is something you can do in your garage on you know, some solid jack stands with some basic hand tools. Dropping an axle is much easier than you think. Let's continue to watch. Now I've made many modifications to my suspension over the years, so my setup may be a little bit different than yours, but the overall removal is generally very similar. The track bar, the drag link, and the tie rod all have to be unbolted from the axle. It's a good idea to drain the axle fluid while it's still up on the lift, and man, mine's pretty clean, and that's a good sign. Before pulling the axle shafts, you can remove the bolt holding the ABS sensor in place. 
they went ahead and removed the axle shafts while it was still on the lift just to make it a little easier. And there are a couple Torx bolts on the back of the knuckle that need to be removed. And then the monster 36 millimeter nut needs to come off. Once that bolt's off there, you might have to give a little bit of motivation to the wheel hub bearing assembly and be careful with that ABS sensor line. You don't want to tear that. Now you can pull the axle shaft out and be careful to do that. You want to make sure you pull that out straight just so you don't mess up that internal seal in case you plan on repurposing this axle housing. Next, they disconnected the electronic locker wiring harness from the differential, which was a little finicky. You really want to take your time here. You don't want this thing to break. They removed the lower section of the sway bar end links, and then once they put a support underneath the axle housing, they removed the lower coilover bolt, which may be the lower shock bolt in many situations. Then they removed the two upper and the two lower control arm bolts, and slid out the axle housing very carefully. This thing is heavy, so it's nice to have an extra set of hands. But look, I told you that was pretty straightforward, not too hard. Okay guys, uh, so they've just finished taking the axle off and it's sitting here on the table and this is Jim, the owner of Dynatrack. Jim, thank you so much for letting me come to the shop here today and your guys doing this amazing work. Uh, I'm really excited uh, to show these guys what the new axle is here. In a minute, we're getting there. Jim. Tell me a little bit about, I mean, you've been here for 30 years. You started right. this business 30 years ago. Right. How did you get into the axle business? So uh, I got into it to solve my own problems. So back in the late 70s, I really got into four-wheel drive. I was into street cars a lot, but I got in a lot of trouble, and I had to do something different. And a friend of mine had a Jeep, started going off-roading, and I realized we could do anything we want out here, and people don't mind as much. Yeah. So uh, I got a Ford. Uh, F-250 pickup, that's what, what everybody was into at the time. Jeeps really weren't very popular uh, for heavy off-roading or hardcore off-roading. And uh, I just got into doing four-wheeling. And, and as at that time, this giant tire came out. It was 36 inches tall. It was incredible. Everybody was you know amazed. Then it went to 38 and a half, then 40s, and then 44s. And the group I was in, we started having axle failures chronically. Oh, yeah. And so I wanted to make sure that I did not have those problems, so I set about building a better axle. Okay, and then it just it, it grew from there. Grew from there, and yeah. now you're making a great product. Thank you. Uh, and, and look, I, I'm ex super excited to be installing this beef here, but before we talk about some of those specs, I want you to give me kind of your general assessment of my current axle, because this thing's got 100,000 miles on it. It's been through the ringer. Mm -hmm. How's it holding up? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm, I'm looking at it, and uh, it's actually, you keep it pretty clean. I gotta tell you, I've seen some come in uh, looking a lot uh, scruffier than this. <laughs> okay. uh, you went ahead and you upgraded to our ball joints. Excellent move. You also put these gussets on your, on your end forgings. Another good move. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big fan of uh, sleeving and trussing these houses because I just think that I could get into a dissertation on why I think that's bad, but I don't think it adds enough strength. It's expensive and it causes distortion. Yep. So in a nutshell, that's why I don't care for that. Okay. This is not a bad upgrade though because it's easy to install. It's low risk. It, it does add some value in my opinion. So why not? Okay. Right? And, it's, and it's, very, it's easy to do. Yeah. You don't have to take a ton of things apart to add to it. Yeah. Um, the housing, I'm looking at it and it could be a little bit of an optical illusion, but I think I do see a slight bow here. Really? And we'd, we'd probably only see that in detail as if we actually put a fixture in there to, to ah. actually measure it, but okay. it's not uncommon. So a little bit of bending in these things is not uncommon. Okay. This zone right here is where the bends uh, occur the most. Okay. Uh, the second area is over here, yeah. and usually that's from a wheel strike. Somebody plugged a rock and yeah. uh, it, it, it bent that tube backwards. So bending tubes backwards and slightly upwards is the, which, which you typically see. Okay. If you didn't see a lot of bad wheel camber, in other words, where you know the tires are towed in or, or pulled in at the top, that would be negative camber, then you, you're bending maybe more this way than that way. Okay. Uh, and and you know some of this is, could be an optical illusion too, but it's, it's very common. Yeah. Uh, the tubing is not as, as robust as, as I think off-roading today demands. Right, and bigger tires. And, and bigger tires. Overlanding, you know, we're carrying yep. a ton of weight. You so. bet, you bet. So uh, I just recently re-welded up uh, my front track bar bracket. Okay. 
Uh, and I know s at least three other people that have had the same problem. So I think that's probably something that's very common. It is. It is. Uh, you know, bracket, uh, the, the, the brackets that take the most stress are the track bars. Uh -huh. uh, the other ones that take a lot of stress is the, the control arm brackets. Particularly when guys do suspension swaps, they oftentimes have adjustable control arms. And two things when they go to install that. One, they don't get all the arms the same length. So right off the bat, there's already a stress of one arm pushing more or pulling more than the other three or the other two, which can cause fatigue at the points of weld. Uh, the other thing that happens is when you put a lift kit on, a lot of times it's on a lift, everything's drooped out. So they tighten everything up super tight and then they lower it on the ground, which twists all the bushings and also creates some initial stress. It doesn't need to be there. So it's, you want the bolts to be loose when you drop it on the ground, tighten everything at curb height when it's just sitting level. Okay. Uh, so those are, those are common, common occurrences. So, do you think this axle can be repurposed? Do you think we can reuse this? I think so. Yeah. I, you know, I think that we can assess, you know, if there is a bow here yeah. or if it's just an optical illusion. I would say that even if there is, it doesn't mean it's junk. It just right. means it's not brand new. Yeah. All right. So, uh, obviously, once the bows and bends get out of hand to where they're wearing tires or they're causing uh, stress, where the spines go into the diffs, things like that. That's another issue. This I don't see anything that bad. Okay. Because I think that's an important discussion to have is, you know, we're buying new axles and that's it's an investment, uh, but there is some value right. that you can resell your old stuff and kind of recoup some of that, right? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm a big fan of, you know, customers don't realize that this Rubicon housing uh, has a lot of value to somebody. Yeah. And a lot of people have already put, uh, even in their uh, sports, they put gear ratios and lockers and things like that. that has value. So, you know, if you want to upgrade for yourself, better to do it before you've damaged this housing to a point where it's not so good anymore uh, and upgrade at that time. Prevent it, do a preventative action instead of a, uh, uh, re a repair action. Right. Yeah. Well, I think these guys are chopping at the bit. Uh, you guys want to know what I got? So we're installing the new Dynatrack Pro Rock 44. And man, just looking at this thing side by side here, I can already tell it's much beefier. Can you run us through, Jim, just some of the highlights of sure. the Pro Rock that make it, you know, as robust as it is? You bet, you bet. So uh, I, I think the number one thing that everyone's gonna see and, and note is the tube mm -hmm. diameter. So as tube diameter grows, strength grows a lot. You can make tubes thicker and thicker and thicker, uh, but and that does add strength, but not as much as is adding it to the outside of the tube. So we're using a three inch tube diameter. The other thing people really notice right off the bat is the end forgings. Uh, we made our own end forgings. They're a lot thicker, especially in beefier at the very top where yeah. you get that cantilever effect and that, that causes them to bend. Right. Uh, the brackets are all uh, 3 16 inch thick, all CNC laser, all welded. It's a lot thicker than the stock bracketry. So things like track bar brackets have a lot uh, less chance of having a failure. And uh, shock brackets are a lot beefier, especially if you're using those shock brackets for coilovers, right? right? Does yeah. that ring a bell? Yeah. And we use a cast coil seat that has the helix built into it. Okay. So when you put your spring in it, it's, it's sitting at the right position. Yeah. Wow. It's just it's a it's a work of art for Thank me. You. At least I love this kind of stuff. Thank you. All right, now what makes the Pro Rock 44 really cool for my application is we get to reuse some of these components. That's right. That's right. right. Uh, we're reusing the knuckles. Yep. Uh, I've already got chrome alloy axle shafts, so we're we're putting those in there. Yep. Uh, we're gonna put the the gears in here in there. And I know that that's probably something that folks may not be really enthusiastic about swapping yeah. gears or may not have the skills to do that, but you can buy this with the gears installed. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, absolutely. In fact, uh, we sell the housing empty. If you want to go get your own gears and lockers, you've mm -hmm. got a buddy, you want to tackle that job, that's great. Many customers would prefer to just do the whole job professionally, less issues, all warranted, yeah. and uh, you can buy it turnkey with gears and diff and everything, shafts ready to go, so it's really plug and play in your driveway basic mechanical tools and everything set yeah, up for yeah. Good to have a buddy to do it, for sure. Yeah. Give it a little extra hand. Okay, I'm gonna ask some, I've got a list here, but a couple sure. of questions that I think these guys will be asking me, and I figured why not sure. just ask them on camera. So these are some general questions about axles and the Pro Rock mm -hmm, 44. Mm -hmm. So, uh, can I confidently run 40s on that Pro Rock 44? So that housing will easily handle 40s, yeah. all right? So the question that you have to ask yourself is, well, what about the knuckles, what about the wheel bearings? Those I cannot answer that for you. Okay. So uh, those are not my products, <laughs> and uh, but I can tell you from experience. The good news about JK is, is we got a lot of experience. Yeah. So I think if you're not running wheel spacers, and you have wheels that don't have you know a big offset that pushes the tire out away from the the center line of the bearings, 
and your duty cycle, the way you use your car is, is reasonable, then you can drive around with 40s and, and do it for a really, really long time. Would I advocate that to a guy who maybe is a little hard on his stuff, who maybe goes further and further into the desert alone, uh, or that has crazy spacers and big offsets, right. so you know, it's kind of got that tire sticking out the body look? No, I wouldn't. I okay. wouldn't recommend that. We have axles that will be better for that guy. Yeah. And if you want to go jumping and do crazy stuff and high-speed desert runs and uh, harsh rock crawling, then we have good axle solutions for that that kind of duty cycle. That's a good segue into my next question. So doing the upgraded 44, the Pro Rock 44, instead of a 60 in front, because mm -hmm. we save a little bit of weight. A lot of weight. Uh, over a 60. How much heavier is the Pro Rock 44 over this one? So we're going to weigh it. Ah. And so we'll get a shot on the scale. Okay, so I'm going to save that one. Okay, for you. follow right. up. Yeah. We'll follow up on that answer. Okay, you guys have the best ground clearance for the housing right. in the industry. How much am I actually saving over this 44? Excellent question. So. Uh, I'm going to give you two numbers that are, are pertinent here. One is at the very, very bottom, the lowest point of both housings, we're a half inch improved. Ah. And that may not sound like a lot, but the, the patented shape of our housing gives you a 26% improvement of frontal impact reduction. Yeah. So as you're approaching a rock or a log or anything on the trail, there's a lot lower probability that it's going to touch your housing than it is on the stock one. The other thing is that, that the bottom of all the Prox as part of the patent is very smooth. So even if you do glance an object, it's going to skim off and deflect as opposed to grabbing a rib yeah. or like on some of the covers, there's, a, there's an edge there. So if you're backing up, all of a sudden it's catch, the rock is catching that edge and not letting you go backwards, you won't have that. Okay. And it's really not a matter of if in my situation, it's a matter of when. When? Absolutely. Because sure. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bang them up yeah, if it sure. happens. All right. Uh, a, a question that people may not know is, what is caster and pinion angle? What, what do those mean? Okay. And why yeah. are they important? They're important. So, uh, uh, caster is basically the angle of the uh, steering axis inclination. So that's, if you drew an imaginary center line from the top ball joint straight through the bottom ball joint, that would form a line. And on cars, we want that to be tilted back at the top a little mm -hmm. bit. So positive caster is when that top ball joint is tilted back and that gives uh, better steering, especially on things like crowned roads uh, and uh, just, just overall vehicle handling. The other thing is wheel camber. So uh, because when you're running bigger tires, sometimes some factory camber settings are too uh, positive and that puts uh, with a skinny tire, no big deal, but as a broader tire, now that tire is not sitting as flat on the pavement as it could. So we also set our camber to be just a little bit, you know, different for a bigger tire car than for a, for a smaller tire car. And, and that's something you've already got dialed into the geometry correct. right out of the that's box, correct. right? So easy to And what about pinion angle? Why is that important? So pinion angle is important because as you wouldn't be putting one of these in there if you didn't have bigger tires. Right. And if you got bigger tires, you probably have a lift kit. Yeah. So driveline angles are important. And so when you take a stock housing and if you just rotated it to reduce the pinion angle at the, at the drive shaft, you'd be taking away that caster. Right. So by building a brand new housing, we are able to dial in the optimum pinion angle and the optimum level of caster to have less, less or zero uh, driveline vibrations and uh, smooth operation at all times. Because you don't have a locking hub here, right? right? So things are spinning all the time. Yeah. So it's important. Cool. That's an awesome upgrade that we got. Okay. Uh, if Let's say a guy is doing this in his garage by himself. Maybe he's got a buddy that can help him. Uh, it's not that hard. But what would you say average person could do this swap in? How much well, I think if you, so we'll take the gear part out of it. Yep. So if you just bought the housing, it was all geared and ready to go, I think you're probably looking at about two guys, maybe four hours. Yeah, and, and I can attest to that. We've done it in a garage now. Mind you, we had a lift, but even, the, even so, it did not take us very long no, to do it. It was a very bad. easy swap. Yeah. Okay. All right, Jim, uh, I want to go get these on the scale before we get there and mount so this good. up. Thanks for talking to us on camera. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, the stock weight of the Pro Rock 44 with no shafts, no gears, 154 pounds. Now we're gonna pull everything out of mine and see how much it weighs. And the weight of the stock axle is 112 pounds. So that's a 42 pound increase of just pure strength. I'm okay with that. Now with my old axle off the Jeep, they removed the knuckle ends and cleaned them up to prepare for swapping them to the new Pro Rock 44. 
They also pulled the differential cover off and took some initial backlash measurements, which will help guide through the settings once the gears are in the new housing. All right guys, so Steve is here pulling the ring and pinion and you're doing some measurements and you were telling me some great stuff. Can you share that with the viewers? Sure, when we remove and replace our gears and we're gonna transfer it, to another, uh, our newer housing, I wanna make sure that my backlash remains the same. I don't disturb the wear pattern. Now we are replacing the bearings with new bearings. It's, uh, it's pretty hard to get the same exact preload on used bearings, so we're putting, here at Dynatri, we put all new bearings. I'm gonna adjust my preload to that, but my backlash and my pattern need to stay the same. Now I'm not going to take you step by step through the full ring and pinion gear removal and install. It's a very technical process, but honestly, it's something that I'd really like to learn how to do one day. It does take a while to become proficient at doing a ring and pinion install, but these guys have been doing it for a long time and it's something they actually get technical calls about to answer for other shops pretty often. One important step is to transfer over the wire sensor over to the new axle and Steve said be careful because this can actually strip out pretty easily if you're not careful. He actually installed and removed the gears in the new housing several times, taking many, many measurements to make sure it, it was the perfect wear pattern. It was fun to watch him work, and I'm a little bit of a garage geek because I could probably watch this for hours. So you know I'm a big proponent of checking your gear often before and after the trail. Pulling all the stuff apart, the guys took a close look at my front axle U-joint, and guess what? It's cracked. This was just a matter of time before this would have failed. I'm so glad that we caught this. Time to replace that. Having a spare U-joint is a good spare part to carry with you, but I'm glad we were able to fix it here in the shop and weren't having to do it out on the trail. After getting that replaced, the guys installed the knuckles and sealed up the differential housing. Steve did drill two small holes in the rib of the housing to allow the electrical sensor to be mounted back on similar to stock. Then the guys tested the lockers by using some simulated axle shafts and an electrical box. First they made sure everything spun properly, then they turned the lockers on and gave it some good torque. Perfect. Installing the axles is very easy. You just bolt everything back up in reverse. Control arms, axle shafts, bearing hubs, brake calipers, drive shafts, steering components, you get the idea. They did weld up a custom steering stabilizer mount because my setup isn't stock and we just wanted to make sure that everything lined up properly and there was plenty of clearance. We did have to get out the ratchet strap to get the track bar to line back up but that's no big deal. Now just put in some differential fluid and we're almost all set. Just one more thing, but I'm gonna let Jim talk about this one. All right, Jim, they just wrapped up everything. We're gonna do a little bit of alignment, but you were just telling me something that I thought was very interesting to share with the viewers. Yeah, so we, obviously we've all heard the horror stories about death wall, right? It, it's, the, it's the curse of owning a Jeep that everybody worries about. In my experience, so I, there's lots of videos on this and, and you know, there's lots of opinions, but in my experience, the top three causes of death wobble are one, looseness, just bushings, bolts, things like that. So that's simple check stuff. The second thing is tires. So I don't care if they're big tires or small tires, sometimes you just get a tire that has a, a little wobble in the carcass or it's, it's way out of balance or it's out of round uh, or it's just worn out. And a lot of times as the tire ages, it'll start to induce death wobble where when it was new, it didn't. The third thing is toe either too much of it, too little of it, but if the toe isn't right, you, you can get death wobble from that too. And it could be a combination of the three right. too. So this is something where those are the top three causes. If you get those three things right, and including up to and including put new tires on the front, your death wobble problems 95%, 98% of the time will be gone. Now this is a rough way to set the toe angle. You just basically take a measurement from any two given points on the front of the tires and then switch around to the back of the tires using those same two given points and you should be roughly about one eighth of an inch smaller on the front or towed in. And then you can make some adjustments using the track bar and then take your measurements again and just until you get it dialed in to right where you want it. Now obviously I will be taking this in for a front end alignment, but this is good enough to get me home. 
Well, we have fast forwarded about a week from installing the Dynatrack axle, and there's a couple things that I really want to mention. One, the first thing I noticed right away driving home on the freeway was my steering just felt so much better. It's more stiff, firm, more responsive, and I think that's because that caster angle has been adjusted to compensate for my lift kit, which I think is very nice. And the other thing is now I've got a little more peace of mind when I'm out here on the trail and I'm wheeling and I don't have to worry about breaking another track bar bracket or a control arm bracket. These things are solid and they're gonna hold up for years and years to come. A big thanks to Dynatrack and the guys that helped install. I really appreciate their support. I'm looking forward to putting many miles on this axle. If you're visiting Trail Recon for the first time, hit that subscribe button. I'd love to have you as a member of the Trail Recon team. Thanks for watching.